Item six is leader's questions. Question number one, Councillor Hogg. Question one to the leader. Um, Mr. Mayor, I thank Councillor Hogg for his question. Um, I know uh, local government finance is quite a complex business, really, but um, perhaps uh, not that complex. Um, but I'm sure one of the things that this council might ask Mr. Bus to do is to uh, do the last last thing is kind of do a little teaching session for Councillor Hogg to understand the difference between uh, local government finance and central government finance. And perhaps you could also take the opportunity to explain that the dictionary definition of reserves is uh, to retain something for future use. And that's precisely what the reserves are built up for, and that's precisely what they're used for. And I think that definition of the word reserves is true in central government, in local government, in household budgets, and I'm surprised that to experienced and senior councillors opposite seem to have always uh, misunderstood or failed to understand their uh, the, the definition of reserves and the proper application of reserves that this council has uh, always uh, indulged in. A supplementary, Mr. Okay. Mayor? Councillor Hogg. Um, well, I mean, he's spending more than he's bringing in and he's having to raise his savings to plug the gap. Call it what you like. Um, I mean, back to these um, reserves, I mean, the council has balances of 500 million pounds. Now, there's half a billion pounds in the bank, which is wasting away because we're earning around 1% interest on that, which is less than inflation. I mean, Wandsworth residents are some of the most financially literate in the entire country. He will be unable to talk down to all of them. Does he accept that they'll be surprised when they hear that Wandsworth Council is holding half a billion pounds of the public's cash, and in real terms, you're managing to lose money. Just let's, let's take Councillor Hogg's um, point that uh, the council at the moment is spending more than it's getting in. I think it sounds like, a bit like a bank statement for the month. There will be a month where you have heavy expenditure and you will have drawn quite a lot of your salary or maybe all of your salary but also last month's savings and at the bottom of the bank statement uh, the bank will say too much out too little in but of course you know that next month it will get corrected and the previous month you had built up something in order to meet the cost or meet the particular uh, cost pressure that's exactly what has happened here and i'm surprised that councillor hogg fails to understand that bit of it as for the half a billion of reserves, again, I'm sure that Mr. Bass and others have explained time and time and time again that not all of them are actually of the same ilk and the same, same type, and not all of them can be sort of put together in one pot and invested at one go. And I'm sure that if Councillor Hogg wants a further alliteration of, of what exactly is the, uh, the, the limit on which how those half a billion pounds can be used, because quite a lot of it's pension money, and it's not available for, for use by council's ratepayers, but it is in fact for the use of council's pensioners, current and, and, and future. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Councillor Hogg, question two. Question number two to leader. Um, I thank Councillor Hogg for his question. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, it's, it's pretty clear from the question that uh, the opposition has failed to understand that what is currently underway by the government is a consultation exercise. The consultation exercise ends on the 22nd of March and after which the government will listen to everyone and come to a view which may remain the same as is in the current papers but until the consultation ends and the government comes up with a, with a, a, a final version of what they want to do with schools funding i think it's premature to, to do uh, do what councillor hogg's doing in this question which is to create a scare story i suspect um, it's a job of oppositions to do scare stories kind of a bit like uh, false news uh, that is so much the rage these days. I'm sorry, Councillor Hogg, sir, onto a loser there. Councillor uh, Hogg. Supplementary. 
Um, well, I'd, I'd invite members to read the question where it sort of says proposed twice. It doesn't include any figures. Um, I, I think Councillor Govindia is supplying alternative facts on this occasion. But the fairer funding that we're talking about here is only part of the picture. Um, you actually have to look at the other things that are impacting on uh, the rising salary costs, pension contributions. There's a national insurance increase coming up. And the figures that you'll have seen quoted are taking all of those cost pressures into account. And of course, recruitment's difficult um, due to local housing situation as well. So um, to give an example, um, since I haven't seen any figures in his answer, um, in Battersea, Belleville School is projected to lose £548,000, equivalent to 14 teachers' salaries. In Putney, the constituency, obviously, of the Education Secretary, Justine Greening, uh, Southfields Academy is set to lose out on £547,000. That's £739 per pupil. And in Tooting, Graveney School will lose over £1 million, equivalent to 23 teacher salaries. Now, I've heard from local heads who are concerned they're already planning the cuts they may have to make. They've talked about music, about counselling and even staff. Um, can he reveal what local school leaders have told him? And I don't see in the answer what his own personal view is on these changes. Could he perhaps tell us? It's interesting, um, Councillor Hogg mentions um, housing pressures as uh, creating some difficulties with uh, teacher recruitment. Um, reminds me of the stance he took over a particular planning application in his ward or on the edges of his ward where the developer produces housing for teachers for the Harris Academy next door in order to address the issue of teacher recruitment, teacher retention and providing affordable housing for teachers. And of course he led the charge to have it refused. Mercifully of course the mayor has rejected his position. So when it comes to schools meeting pressures, there are innovative and new ways of doing it. It doesn't all have to translate into the nearest sort of, uh, 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 sort of doom and gloom story. Just take a leaf out of this council's book. We have all faced cost pressures and we haven't uh, reached for the immediate kind of answer saying let's sack all the offices because that's the way to save money. No, there are other ways of saving money and of course the schools need to need to take a stab at it and of course this council will assist them in making sure that they make the right decision and protect the front line as I suggested earlier. Second supplementary. I, I believe I deserve a That's second quick, yeah. chance as I was directly referenced but I would request that you occasionally chase him up for an answer. He is paid to come here and answer the questions we're asking him. But I wasn't leading the charge against this development. His best friend was leading the charge for this development. I was unaware of the three or four units that were offered for teachers when I opposed it on the grounds of it being too tall, not having enough affordable housing, overshadowing conservation areas, as okay. did 98% of the local thank people you. who yeah. actually thank you responded very much. to the consultation. Uh, thank you very much. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Tracy, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, would the leader um, have more confidence in the figures that were published by the DfE uh, last week, or the figures um, that Councillor Hogg is quoting, which have come from a lobbying group. The figures that DfE published last week show a loss for Groveney School. Um, it, is, it comes out to about 1.4% of 162,000, nothing like the million uh, that he's suggesting. I thank Councillor Tracy. I mean, as I said earlier at the start of this question, that. Um, Perhaps um, the opposition thinks it's their job to do scare stories, and that is exactly what seems to have happened here. The DFE figures are best guess and best illustration, and that is the best one we have. They themselves may not be absolute, who knows, but they are far more reliable than any other figures banded about, either by Councillor Hogg or others. And, and I know that uh, Councillor Tracy has taken a c clear interest in, in, in this subject and she would be able to say which figures are more reliable than Councillor Hogg's. Thank you. Councillor Usher. Um, thank Councillor Usher for your question. I think one of our housing officers often says that um, 
when it comes to delivering affordable housing by kind of percentage, uh, uh, then uh, too high a percentage results in zero. So 50% of zero is zero. And that's uh, precisely what seems to have happened in this uh, particular situation. There was the estate and the Mopax uh, ownership which was sweated or, or disposed of in various parts. And interestingly enough, in Battersea, the Battersea Pass police station was uh, closed and redeveloped. Uh, from memory, around 50 uh, units were produced, of which uh, 10 were for affordable housing, and it's done, dusted, occupied, lived in, and so on. I know that um, police stations in uh, uh, Greenwich and Rotherhithe uh, closed roughly at the same time, uh, remain shut, uh, remain costing a fortune in security and keeping them weatherproof, and of course remain undeveloped because the mayor has slapped a, a, a requirement which uh, clearly doesn't tempt anyone to come forward. Councillor Asher. Thank Councillor Asher for her question. I mean, I think that the question illustrates exactly what the problem with land disposal by public authorities is. If the land is to be disposed in order to fund capital investment or, or to balance books in some cases, then to add a further purpose for the disposal of land does mean that you are robbing Peter to pay Paul. And that's precisely the problem with the MOPAC land disposal. And there's a real risk that that would be the problem with the TFL land disposal. In fact, I think um, uh, there is a recent press statement that uh, precisely because of that conflict, the mayor has gone to the government to say, can I please dispose land at less than best consideration? Well, you know, the mayor should have known that before he was elected, that the reason for disposal, uh, that the requirement for disposal of public land is always best consideration, and therefore he shouldn't have double counted it at the start of, the, of his term. Supplementary, Mrs. Leone Cooper. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, would you not agree, um, uh, Councillor Govindia, that when circumstances change, that sometimes a change of approach is a sensible uh, way forward? Um, for example, we changed our policy um, in terms of what we do in terms of purchasing and the sale of some of our properties and have chosen to use those for homeless families. Do you not agree that the scale of the housing crisis as it's developed in London has now um, one that the current mayor is addressing and that it has changed from the time of his predecessor? I thank Councillor Leonie Cooper for supplementary. I mean, I think, of course she's right. Of course she's right that uh, when circumstances change, you must react to change circumstances. But what I am saying, and what I said earlier to Councillor Usher's supplementary, was that the mayor knew exactly what the situation was, particularly about the disposal of public land. He knew what the constraints were. He did promise more than he could deliver. Of course the mayor is uh, uh, delivering the housing uh, challenge for London, but he's greatly assisted by the uh, record 3.15 billion given to him by, by the government. Now let's wait and see that he's nearly a year into his, his four-year term, uh, unlikely to do a second term because of ambitions elsewhere, and he's got three years in which to deliver the 90,000 promise, and there is nothing, nothing on the plus side of that 90,000 account yet. Let's hope there will be more before he's finished. Um, thank Councillor Anderson for her question. Uh, I think at the heart of this question is what is uh, behind the whole business of uh, contracting out services. If you contract out services, a local authority says that this is the service we need, these are the standards at which it should be delivered, and, and somebody bids for it and somebody wins a tender, and then they get on to delivering it. And, and they satisfy the council that they have the resources, means, and ability, and track record, and all of those things, and they get on with doing the job. 
What we don't do as a, as, as a, as a, uh, as a sort of commissioner of that contract or that service is to sort of run the management for that company because that's precisely the advantage that contracting out is supposed to deliver to the commissioner authority or the commissioner company. And what, what, what I'm saying to Councillor Anderson is the matter for matter of what the pay levels are for the employees of our contractor is a matter for the contractor and of course legal authorities should they be in breach of the law. If they're in the breach of the law, yes as best friend we might remind them of their legal duty. But getting deep into the entrails of their contractual relationship is exactly what contracted out services allow us not to do and in fact require us not to do. Councillor Anderson. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that residents of Wandsworth are very concerned at the moment about the, uh, the, the, the strike by the street cleaners and, um, and uh, need a bit more reassurance. But I'd also like to talk about another area that is, is contracted out and that we do have control over future tendering for, which is um, carers in Wandsworth. The UK Home Carer Association estimates that the cost of home care is £16.70 per hour when sustainable, good home care services are fully compliant with the national minimum wage, which we are delighted to see that uh, we have brought it in for our own um, workers. Wandsworth, however, pays just £13.30, far off the £16.70. Would Wandsworth consider, and will you as leader, will you consider reviewing this amount for future joint services contracts, especially in the light of the fact that Richmond Borough pays £15.93 um, in recognition of the need to address the current crisis in adult social care. Supplementary in two parts. Um, the current strike you mentioned and mentioned a great number of residents are concerned about it. I'm sure there are um uh, if I don't know anything about it, there's no position to be about it. Uh, the last time somebody said that there was a picket outside the town hall, he said that there were kind of half a dozen people and equal number of trumpets, um, which, uh, which made a lot of noise but not a great, great message. I'm sure that they, it's well felt. I am sure that uh, the strikers feel they have a cause. I'm not, uh, in a sense, disputing it. But if she's claiming lots of residents are deeply concerned, may I say that nobody has written to me. Doubtless, tomorrow they will be a deluge. <laughs> So I have only myself to blame for it, uh, but then we will know where the deluge comes from. Uh, turning to the, point, the differential between Richmond and Wandsworth in terms of cares, you know, I never like to tell fellow leaders of any persuasion how they should run their council, but if I had Lord True's council tax income, I am sure I could have a different budgetary uh, uh, way of dealing with that income. No further supplementary. Uh, Councillor Grimston. Okay, question five of the leader. Uh, I thank I thank Councillor Grimston for his question. I think um, this issue has ra been raised before in different forms in this in this chamber, and I have made very plain as to what my position is, and I have made very clear that. Uh, in this current uh, rather difficult times uh, and uncertainties around uh, following the, the vote on the EU referendum, uh, it is right that uh, we should seek to provide certainty to those, those who feel uh, worried and concerned. And I'm, I'm willing to speak to anyone about it, but I have to say that uh, this is an issue on which uh, this council has limited, limited pull, um, given that uh, we are not at any negotiating table, but where I am, I have made my position clear. Councillor Grimston. Um, Supplementary, I, I, I thank the Leader for the tone of his uh, uh, answer and indeed for the, for the tone of the contribution he made to our debate at the last Council, which I fully accept. Uh, nonetheless, I, I, if I may just refer to an email which I received from a joint uh, Swedish-New Zealand passport holder in my ward. Uh, she said, but via my European passport, I've 
lived nearly a third of my life in the UK, in fact longer than I've ever lived anywhere else, the remainder of my life being divided between Sweden, New Zealand and the US, and very much called London home. I'm married to a Brit with whom I own a property and we're expecting a new addition to the family this year. While eligible to apply for UK re residency, upon reading the rules I do not actually qualify as I've spent too much time abroad in the last five years and indeed the last 12 months, largely due to work commitments. Um, there is, I think, something of a myth going around that those who have lived for five years in this country will automatically be able to apply and receive permanent residence. That is not the case. And I think the Select Committee, I wonder if the leader would uh, agree. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm being stupid, but I'm not sure that I am absolutely clear about his position uh, on this. We've just seen over a quarter of those in the last two quarters of 2016 who applied for permanent residence were turned down. Uh, in this country. This is enormous worry for many in my ward and across the borough. And I wonder if I could just ask for a simple yes or no question, uh, answer for him. The Select Committee says we recommend that the UK should now make a unilateral decision to safeguard the right of UK, U, EU nationals living in the UK. Does he agree with that statement or not? I don't really see that there's a third option. I know that Councillor Grimston um, wants me to give him a very clear one-word answer, and I can't and I won't, partly because I have not acquainted myself with the details of the Select Committee report that he claims, he, he, he quotes, doubtless he has. But I'll just say to, to, to him and others that the issue of uh, kind of New Zealand, Swedish uh, a, a passport holder or with, with a British husband is a complicated one and in inevitably will have different answers. Uh, I suspect uh, on one basis they have a right to remain, on the other basis they don't have a right to remain and so on. This country's immigration laws are complex and always have been. It reminds me of my time in, uh, in Uganda just as I was leaving that there were households where depending on where a person was born they were entitled to come here and, uh, and, and, and or not entitled to come, uh, come here. And it wasn't a straightforward division between borders of countries but it was di borders divisions between towns which bit of the town was part of the British India and which part of the town was princely India. And I have to say that inevitably there will be similar complications here depending on how many visits abroad you might or might not have made counting towards your permanent stay. But it's not a subject on which I am qualified to give categorical assurances of the type uh, Councillor Grimston seeks. But let me assure him and others that our, and, and mine and this council's majority view is very plain that we seek to make lives of all the, the nationals of EU countries living in this borough and in fact beyond this borough as comfortable and as free of uncertainty as we possibly can. Supplementary Councillor Dawson. Thank you Mr Mayor and I thank the leader for his responses. Um, as I actually attended the lobby of Parliament on the 20th of February organised by the Three Million Group together with several residents uh, from Europe uh, who live in this borough um, would the leader acknowledge there are opportunities for individual councillors to show their support for our European residents um, and especially as the three million group is now pressing for emergency legislation straight after the triggering of article 50 rather than a flawed amendment to amendment 50, to article 50. Can I thank Councillor Dawson for, for his supplementary. I mean, I, I acknowledge very much that Councillor Dawson has taken a, a personal and committed interest in this subject uh, uh, and, and I'm sure he's far, far better informed than I am. But you know, he asks whether we should all take individual action. He's absolutely right. It's a bit like what Councillor Salia said earlier about individuals taking responsibility or helping take responsibility to ease the burden of others and so on. In fact, if I may say so, uh, not too long ago, Councillor Gimston would have subscribed to this idea that we all have a duty towards ourselves and each other in our wider community. And that's exactly what Councillor Dawson, Dawson supplementary suggests. If that is what it is, I entirely agree with you. Thank you. That concludes the allotted time for questions to the leader.